the two cup. Okay. Uh, what's your issue? Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah, you have the good ones. Yeah, it's superpower. Um, and people would say that autism is a superpower. Was, like, yeah, but my I talked with another uh comedian the other day. She told me OCD actually come from many different forms. Mm -hmm. uh, for in her case, she just really afraid of puke. Oh, okay. And she's not organized. Okay. So in your case, you get the good OCD. Well, I will say that my OCD was much higher when I was Mormon. So there's different types of OCD. Mm -hmm. There's like ordering. That's what a lot of people know. That's mm -hmm. when you know things need to be alphabetized or color coded or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then contamination OCD is probably the most common one that people know about. That's like having to wash your hands all the time. Yeah. So I had what's called scrupulosity, which is sort of like spiritual contamination. Mm -hmm. So I was obsessed with um, like pleasing God and uh, having, so Mormons believe that if you live righteously, you're keeping the commandments, then God will help direct you. And so you're taught to pay attention to your thoughts because the Holy Spirit will speak to you in a still small voice, which is a recipe for anxiety off the charts. So I would do things like I'd be washing the dishes, my daughter would be out playing, and I'm like, wait, is she okay? What if she's face down dead in a ditch? Did it? And so I'd stop what I was doing because I would have this thought and I would think, oh, is that the Spirit telling me go check on your daughter? Because when you're a Mormon, you hear a lot of stories about someone who was driving a car and they thought, call your brother. And then they called their brother and like, oh, thank you, you called me. I was just thinking about ending my life. And, and you're like, if I wouldn't have followed that prompting, he would be dead. So there's a lot of this when you get like a feeling, then you go with it. And so, especially caretaking children, they're taking a nap and, wait, are they dead? What? Like, the, normally their nap is an hour and it's been an hour and a half like what so i would run in and check on them and then go back to the dishes and then 10 minutes later check them again and so yeah because you have those boys and uh, because of the religion mm -hmm. instead of like normal advice to say okay ignore it and it's just yeah a they'll be fine and they, they, yeah the idea that you, it will okay. be the holy spirit uh -huh. versus just regular anxiety so that was yeah. part of it the other was um, I read the Book of Mormon every single day without skipping a day for 17 years, 18 years. How, how sick is the book? Um, it's like 500. I mean, I didn't have to read the whole book, but I had to at least read a verse. It was like the equivalent of washing your hands. So um, even the days that I gave birth, like it was, I need to read the Book of Mormon. And that's actually celebrated in Mormonism. It's considered being, you're being righteous and you're being faithful. And mm -hmm. so... You're, you're kind of rewarded for being astute. And yeah. so um, I would do things like every time I got behind the wheel of a car, I would say a prayer mm -hmm. that like God would protect me and you know get me where I needed to go. Yeah. Just kind of stuff like that. So now that I don't hold those same beliefs, I don't feel as um, compelled to do that. But I do, I mean, there's other things um, like counting things sometimes, counting you know how many steps I take <laughs> counting one is um, uh, sometimes I'll count when I'm frustrated that something's taking longer than I want it to like if someone's talking and it then I'll just go one one less and two I'm like see it only took them 15 seconds to finish their thought um, I listen to podcasts in like two times the speed because I just it's so it's it, it, don't you feel that uh, after a while it really like uh, increase your anxiety of listening to, to it like, so fast yeah i i do that too but uh, it feels like it increases my anxiety to listen to it at normal speed because i'm like speed up um but one of my favorite podcasts is no such thing as a fish and there's four of them and they're all very smart and will talk on top of each other and i have seen how listening to that in two times the speed there are times where i will miss bits and that I, I do find I enjoy it better at a slower speed because then I can catch all the little tags and jabs that they do in between. But I, I feel behind and that I'm trying to catch up. And so, uh, I mean, I go, I go out, I've been, I've been trying to um, calm down a little. Like I, I do, you know, two to three shows or mics a night. And sometimes I just think, I don't want to- Every night. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't want to climb to the top. But do you have children? I know. How? 
My husband. I have a husband, and he but, watches them. So he just he has no social life. Oh wow! But but I but I want to be sensitive to that because that happens to comedians where they're so obsessed about getting to the top that they work 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 work, and they kind of blow off their friends and family, and then they get to the top and they're alone, and then they're like, oh, come back, and they're like, you you didn't care about us before, and so I'm trying to be sure that I enjoy it. So there are times where oh, I could go out to this mic, but. I just want to watch a movie with my husband mm -hmm. and just kind of chill out. So um, I try to make a conscious effort to um, to enjoy myself and rest is work too. It, it can be, <laughs> you're like, yeah, you, you get that. Like it, you can it's have to train yourself to like, I'm going to take a nap. Like I slept almost all day yesterday. I finished my show and I went home and I couldn't find my keys and I told the Airbnb host and she never got me one. So I was just like, well, I'll take a nap. Woke up from the nap, didn't hear anything from her. Took another nap. Woke up again. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I was like, I'm just going to sleep through. And, but but that's, that was good for show? my... Well, it was 12.45 p.m. I have a lunch show. Mm -hmm. So when my show got out, I took the bus back to my place. And mm -hmm. then I just slept basically until 8 the next morning. And But that's that's good too because I was finding... Do you find what, like if you're overly tired the focus on stage, it's, it's so weird because it, normally when you go on stage, you're like nervous and scared and you're trying to remember all this stuff. I have found myself the last few shows like zoning out where I'm, I'm doing a bit that I know and then my brain is thinking about something. I'm actually saying other words and going, yeah, I wonder if I should call them back because, and I'm like, oh, what if you accidentally say this out loud? Like, no, like you're, you're in a room full of people that are listening to you, like focus. It's, it's so uh, crazy. And yeah. so I thought, okay, I need to get more sleep. <laughs> So that I can yeah. be present in the thing that I'm yeah, doing. Yeah, I totally understand what you say. And for me, it's like uh, comedy is great also because I can't focus. I have ADHD, and the comedy mm. is the only time when I'm on stage, I'm like a hundred percent focus, like mm. everything, mm -hmm. and it's very enjoyable. Um, with OCD, are you organized? I am organized, but it's funny because I'm, I'm just organized enough. To feel good about things how things are going mm -hmm. but the compulsion is there so I feel badly that I'm not as organized as like you know what I mean like like my little schedule here I'm like, oh, I didn't write out my schedule yet I meant to do that whereas I think other people will kind of do their schedule and go oh yeah I need to get to that so there's this burden that as organized as I might seem to someone else I'm not as organized as I wish that I were and so it's like I feel like I have like lazy OCD. It's like you know, <laughs> it's like you have the the mindset to be obsessive, but not always the will to carry it out. But you, <laughs> you, but you have the guilt for not carrying it out because because I know I can. Like some people don't know how to be organized, and they're like, yeah, I need help with them. Like I know how to be organized. Please go to my home. Yes, I. My, I my would, storage That's room one is of my waiting. favorite things to do is organize other people's stuff mm -hmm. because the, like. I like coming in, doing something, and go. All right, good luck with that. I and don't the, like the follow-up. And the one are you going to Berlin? I have been uh, waiting it's, it's, for more than a year it's, now. It's on my list. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. again, kids and a husband. So basically, I use up my punch card at Fringe. They let me come out here for a month. My husband holds down the fort. So asking for other international trips is quite tricky, mm -hmm. unless there's, you know, quite cash. a bit of cash. Yeah. At compensation for it. Um, that my and that's another thing that I feel obsessive about is I feel like I'm taking away time from my family I'm pursuing my career my dreams and so I feel a compulsion to be as good as I can as fast as I can making money in comedy as soon as I can and my friend Mike Kaplan said uh, you shouldn't expect to like make make money like as a living in comedy until you've been in for 10 years and I remember thinking well that's good for you Mike you don't have children uh, you know you don't uh, like you of course um, like of course you have the luxury to like I have three dependents that need to be fed and have a roof over their head and it's kind uh, of not fair to my husband to uh, carry that burden while yeah. I'm what he does he's a software designer Oh, okay, that's uh, that's why he can't afford this. Well, he's like mid level, and it's also, you know, three kids and rent and food, so it would help if I. So would you we're, say we're not you're struggling? Rolling in it. Um, we're very frugal, so if we lived like most of our friends, we would be struggling. If we had our kids and lots of lessons, if we had, 
a newer car if we had a bigger house like we would be struggling but we're very good at living within our means and mm -hmm. not I mean like all the clothes I get are from thrift stores they're like a dollar each mm -hmm. you know stuff like that so showing off your perfect size uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, what got you into comedy um I always wanted to do it but it seemed selfish and incompatible with family life mm -hmm. and it turns out it is it is, uh, it is selfish and uh -huh. incompatible family life, but I love it so much that, uh, like, and, so and did, oh, did you want to do it even when you were religious? When I was a little kid, people used to tell me all the time I should either be a comedian or have like a talk show, like a like be Ellen or something mm. like that. Um, but because I was so dedicated to the Mormon Church, I my plan was to marry. Like to not put off marriage, I should say. I was going to say to marry as young as I could. It wasn't that I wanted to get married at 18, but I knew if I met the right person that it would be selfish to put that off. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to marry young, have as many kids as I could. And then, um, but how come you married at 26? That's quite a late. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was worried. I like it, I had really high standards for who I would mm -hmm. marry. And mm -hmm. so it just took a lot longer than I thought. Aww. I also liked guys that were way better looking than I was, which also didn't help. Um, <laughs> I could have married younger if mm -hmm. I didn't. It was unreasonable how handsome mm -hmm. and religious or spiritual I wow. expected. And I, I wouldn't date anyone that wasn't Mormon. I wouldn't date people who I didn't think I could marry. Like if I, if I could not imagine myself marrying someone, I wouldn't even go on a first date with them. Wow. Yeah. And um, so are you saying Mormons have sense of humor also? Mormons are quite funny. They're quite, because they don't, um, they're not allowed substances, coffee, tea, tobacco, alcohol, <laughs> drugs, pornography, masturbation, all that kind of stuff. Gambling, R-rated movies. So they make their own fun. Mormons are quite fun. And mm -hmm. they're really good at kind of coming up with activities. They're very pro-social. You think they're more fun than Christians? Oh yeah. Totally. Why is that? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I would maybe other people wouldn't think they are, they are fun, but I think they're fun when you're in the group. Like, their Mormons are quite creative. Um, Why is that? I think one of the things. So they don't have paid clergy. So everybody in the Mormon church, it's all hands on deck. So from the time you're a little kid. Uh, you will give a talk in front of like 300 people. Uh, once a month they have what I jokingly call Open Mic Sunday, where it, they call it Fast and Testimony Meeting, but basically there's a congregation of say up to, you know, three to five hundred people. Sometimes, the, like in Berlin, the congregation is probably 50 people, like it's smaller there. They have Mormons in Berlin? Oh yeah, there, there are more Mormons that are outside the U.S. than inside. Um, I even went to church in China, but you can only go with uh, non-Chinese nationals. Like mm -hmm. Chinese um, Mormons can only go with Chinese Mormons, and anyway. So uh, at okay. they are Chinese Mormons. Yes. What the fuck? They have to list the church under entertainment, and I think they call it like circus or clowning or something. It's not registered as a religion. How come they are Mormons in China? Um, most of them find it abroad and then they join it abroad and then they come back and they still want to practice it. So they are Chinese, they want to abroad, abroad. Mm -hmm. where there are so many things happening, they decide, okay, what I'm going to pick up is Mormonism. Well, my, so my brother served a mission in Vancouver, Canada, uh -huh. Mandarin speaking. Oh. So he learned Chinese and he... Um, he taught people there and then their visas would run out and they have to go back to China. So there are no Mormon missionaries in China. But if you join the Mormon church outside of China and you come back, you can still practice it in your own kind of way. And so when I went to China, I actually met up with someone that my brother taught, who was a Mormon. He <laughs> saved my life. Like he, he helped get me out of the airport in uh, Guangzhou mm -hmm. to like figure out where I was and get a wow. cab and get like the cash machine wouldn't work and so he spotted like it was great so um, so I did go to church when I was over there but it was like with 10 other 
people and they were all like Americans or Australians. And uh, how come you are not religious, not really religious anymore? What happened? Um, I did a, I did some research and some soul searching, starting mostly during the pandemic, and felt that it what just wasn't for me. They sometimes Mormons will talk about their shelf broke. Like you'll find out something and you go, oh, I don't really like that, but is it big enough for me to even go? I'm going to put that on the shelf. Then you find another thing like polygamy was one that I always hated, never liked it, and then I was polygamy more than one wife. You have that in moment? Not anymore, but they did, and they will eventually. Why? Uh, because everyone in Mormonism, everyone has to be married to go to the highest level of heaven, and there's going to be more women than men, so everyone has to be paired up with somebody. I don't understand. Yeah, it's that would be in the next life. But see, this is exactly what I went through. Was like I never liked polygamy, but then when I actually learned about how it was practiced, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I really don't like this at all. Like Joseph Smith getting a revelation from God that polygamy was in the Bible, and why isn't it now? Because you read about it, you know, all these other wives. Like, how come we stopped practicing that? And God's like, glad you asked. You can start practicing it again, which his wife was not cool with. Then he got like a revelation that she needed to shut her mouth and let. So, yeah, it was it was not it was not good uh, in, in in my no, opinion. No, we need it. We need it. I lost four in ND theaters here. Uh, I had you know, to. They're so tiny. Yeah, and the way so you are on the way, like it's just yeah. And I learned that it's consumable. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, so when I learned about how polygamy was practiced, the logic didn't stack up because the, the reasons for it that were given to me when I was a kid and a teenager was like, oh, okay, and I just need to have faith. But then when I actually saw how it was practiced, I was like, oh, this doesn't stack up. So that was one thing, but there, there's, there's other things. My husband did more research on like the Book of Mormon and the accuracy of this and historical stuff. And mine uh, was more of a social thing. Mine was more, like if these are God's people, then these, they say by their fruits, you shall know them. So like if a tree has fruit on it, you can tell if it's a good tree by the taste of the fruit. Mm -hmm. And my whole life, I felt like the fruit was good. But in 2020, 2021, I was like, oh, this, I don't like this fruit. I don't like the tree. Mm -hmm. And part of his Trump support. There are so many Mormons that, including my parents and my in-laws that support Trump. And they're really good people, but my parents, not Trump. <laughs> um, and I was just like, how, like, are, how do we speak the same language? Like, it just, it, it really blows my mind. And I know people are more than the political parties they support, but I think growing up learning about World War II and all the atrocities, that you always think, oh, I wouldn't have supported Hitler. I wouldn't have. And you're like, well, we have people who are, because they're, Trump would kill his enemies if he could. I mean, absolutely. He's. He's a fascist, and uh, mm. he would he would imprison anyone that spoke against him. Hundred percent. He has no idea how the Constitution works. Yeah, the rule of law. Those kind. Of, anyways, I'm kind of getting off. The and the here. question is, um, this revelation we realize you don't like it. You don't. Uh, it's not for me. Want to do it anymore? Did it come in one day? Oh, like gradual, definitely uh. gradually. Yeah. But it was it's it like the, the tipping broke. point? I, cu I kept putting things on the shelf, and eventually they say my shelf broke. Like there was, it was a yeah. tipping point. Yeah, uh, because for me, like uh, I made a decision. I decided I don't want to. I kind of want to quit comedy, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I mean is, I don't want to. Like I realized, doing open mics every night, going out at six. Seven days a night is really not for me. Hmm. I can't do it, and uh, I decide I will only like do really important shows mm -hmm. um, on mm. the weekends and the tour, uh, do my solos, festivals. But I don't want to have this open mic life anymore. Because when did you decide that? That's my point. Like, uh, oh, you're deciding that right now, but you um, haven't implemented no, it. No, like I, I kind of decided before French. Okay. And uh, there's a moment of clarity, mm -hmm. but um, it, the clarity came up in the expression of burnout and depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I just realized I really, really don't want to do it. 
And uh, when I realized this, I realized, I look back, I realized actually, there's this battle for a very long period of time, I just didn't want to face it. Mm. Because when my emotions, when my feelings feel, oh, I really don't want to do this, the rational is like, if you don't do this, are you a comedian? Mm. Like if you're really a comedian, you would love this and you'd never think of quitting kind of thing. Yeah, I love doing comedy. Mm -hmm. I just don't like to go out every night. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, if you want to... Mm. That's kind of a Seinfeld thing that he brags about. Mm. I went out every night for, you know, without skipping for a year and a half, I never missed a night kind of thing. There's, That's yeah. because you don't like to be at home. But for me, it's like... Um, one hand is social anxiety, mm -hmm. um, a very trusted friend, companion, and a comedy colleague uh, in the heat of the moment said something really, really hurt me. Oh. They said, uh, you are rude, you hurt people, everyone talking behind your side, your, mm -hmm. your back. And it really stick to me because the voice inside of me believed this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And this is just a confirmation mm -hmm. for the voice to prove to me. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm right the whole time. And this just make the... I just feel so anxious and so so uncomfortable in the green rooms. And then, mm -hmm. on top of that is ADHD. <laughs> I really, really enjoy work. For me, I can't work two hours. I have to work ten hours. Mm. And for my schedule, all the mental health practice I have, meditation, exercise, walking the dogs, keeping the flat clean, writing diaries. When I finish this, it's already 2, 3 p.m. Yeah. And, and at 6, 7, I have to leave and I just never get sit down. Mm -hmm. I can't work like this. I have, when I write, get into the flow. I have to leave and so every time when I have to leave it's it's like oh, I don't want to go like so is comedy like the, this compulsion to go out uh, what not compulsion don't want to go out uh, oh the, well this idea like because you you've realized that going out every night is not good for your mental health so why did you feel like prior to now that you had to go out every night is it a money thing is it a success thing is no it it's just comedy if you do comedy you have to do this so is it, it. is it because you want to make it your career and make money? You want the respect of your peers? Because you, that's what I'm saying, like, or, or, or just the idea that your identity is a comedian and in order to maintain that identity, you have to tick these boxes in the same way that yeah. if someone's a piano player, well, piano players practice every day, even if they're not necessarily trying to be a famous piano player, they feel like they can't say Yeah, I feel if I don't do this, I'm not a com comedian. Okay. And that's how and I it's feel. important to you to be to identify as a comedian. Yeah. And and is that you want the group to identify you as a comedian or you want you to be able to introduce yourself to people as a comedian? I I'm like who's deciding if you're a comedian or not? I think in your eyes. I, I can't answer this question. Okay. But I have another answer. Okay, that's fine. Um you know, I, I fear the the yeah, I actually can also. I feel the identity of comedy is comedian is very important for me mm -hmm. because um, um, pre-comedy, my life was hmm, never like have joy almost, mm. and uh, I was not happy for majority of my life, mm. and uh, I. As I always joke that my, my mom raised me as an accountant mm -hmm. and my dream was to become an accountant and mm -hmm. I always, I, I was, please her. not please her, it's just, I don't know what to do, I never have, have you watched the movie Soul? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just feel I never found my spark and I thought I'm, I'm oh. ordinary, mm -hmm. I feel like, a, even in school, I got the best education like possible, mm -hmm. but even in school, like I'm hardworking. I'm so do you not, feel like I'm not bad. Your spark? Yeah, like it's yeah, like yeah. I, I just feel like I, was your spark. I never had a light in my life, and mm. comedy brought this light in me. Okay. And when I was really, really depressed six years ago, mm -hmm. I I went on stage the first time, and. Uh, 
immediately I just feel this power in me and this energy mm. and I told myself okay from now on I will never never leave stage this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life interesting and wow. uh, and uh, so many things happened in my life my life went for the better mm. on day and night and uh, and it's because of the comedy brought me. Yeah. And if you think about that, if I don't do this, who I am? It's almost like comedy is a <laughs> friend of yours that pulled you through a dark time and you feel like you have to be loyal to that friend because they lifted you out. And if you aren't in touch with that friend enough, the friendship will wane. I think the, the uh, analogy is more like I was a piece of shit. Oh. <laughs> and uh, comedy is the only thing that I'm not. When you say piece of shit, you mean you weren't good at things or you were rude to people? Because if, if I call someone a piece of shit, it means that they're they're shitty or rude. Everything. Like, uh, hmm. without comedy, people just think I'm rude. Hmm. I'm weird. I never get into groups. I'm awkward in front of people. Um, like I'm ordinary, I was never good, really good at something. I can work hard, and people always say, "Oh, it's good," but I deeply, I know I'm not good. I have imposter syndrome, and mm. at each job, I always feel I'm just getting by, and I have depression. I know things, and mm. um, I just feel I, I don't feel I'm smart. And uh, and the comedy, you go out a lot because it's like I mean, is there a point where you've been out so much and written and when I say write, like writing on stage, that you're you're making enough material that that starts to eclipse that? Because I think at the beginning when you don't have much and you're like working really hard and you're like, oh, I'm trying to get, is there ever a level of competency that you hit where you don't feel? Like an imposter, or that it should no, no, no. Are there ever uh, what I mean is, that you're like, oh, I am good? Is there ever a no, time no? Where you I get think that? you didn't understand me. Okay, okay. What I mean is before comedy, okay. but as soon before, as I did comedy, oh, I know I'm good. The okay. first open mic, I was, oh. oh, I was killing it. I know I have okay. talent. I didn't really speak English. I own the competition, the whole Berlin. Okay. Uh, beat oh, all those okay. English speakers. And uh, comedy, like I just feel I have okay. this super. That makes sense. So that was pre-comedy life. Yeah. Not co okay. And but uh, because you don't feel that now, you don't feel imposter syndrome as a comedian yeah. right now. But you do feel compelled to continually get up there to kind of yeah. Because that. this is the only thing I'm good at. I never found anything I'm really really good at. Mm. And uh, all those negative things about me, all those trauma, those things I'm ashamed. In comedy, this is gold. This become a superpower. Even my laugh, like I had a soul searching session a few days ago, mm -hmm. within 24 hours. I want to see a comedy show, Power Curry. Mm -hmm. He laughed my laugh and he was commenting on it the whole time. And at the end of the show, he was holding my hand. He's come on stage with me. He really, really laughed my laugh. And then uh, the second day I she did a show. have a fantastic laugh. I can. I can confirm that. Then the second day I went to a show, a friend told me, he said, like, can you stop fake laugh? It's so fake, it's disturbing. I'm like, it's mm. not fake, it's my own laugh. Mm -hmm. And he said, but it sounds fake. I said, why are you telling me this? I told you it's not fake. Mm -hmm. It's biological. There's nothing I can change it. Mm -hmm. You cannot change your laugh. There's no way you can do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I feel so upset. And then in the evening, I was doing this podcast. A comedian showed up. She told me, I made a clip of Black Widows of her. Mm -hmm. She said she keep watching that clip over and over because my laugh was inside. And it's so contagious. Yeah. Yeah. And she loves it. And uh, this is just a reinforce of a lesson I'm trying to learn. that. Um, like lots of things not good about me when it's in comedy it become a superpower yeah like lots of people think i have a weird laugh mm -hmm. but in comedy this is fantastic yeah i also learned yeah it's kind of like like running right like running is something people like to do but it's it's inappropriate or unappreciated in a store mm -hmm. by a pool by but it's like oh but running's a good thing and so it's like the thing that you're good at that you enjoy yeah. has found the uh, venue or yeah. the, um, the so, appropriate way to express it where yeah. instead of people saying stop running 
just don't run in the store and you're like, oh, like you finally yeah. found a place to so, and so, get better at it. And so this is the reason, like, you know, if you think about it, my life was so much darkness. I was rejected, uh, bullied my whole life. Mm. And I always fear I'm, uh, I'm trying so hard to be an ordinary person, to be normal. But I was just never, and I just feel like a failure constantly. I was trying to find a boyfriend mm -hmm. for years and years. Like there are so much like rejection, mm -hmm. and um, and this just take a toll on me. You just feel you're not, especially given that I I from a broken home and I was bullied. This just take a toll on me. You just like yes, and the voice inside of you just think yes. All the rejection were right because, like, mm. and but then in comedy, all these things changed. I, I know I'm good. I know mm. I'm talented. I know I have so much power in me, and I never know that. And the comedy just made me to believe myself. I yeah. never believed myself in my life. Wow. And, uh, and then it's so healing too because as you share those, <laughs> like, can you talk about that on stage? Yeah, being being bullied and yeah. and it, okay, because I've seen you in showcases doing like short. I haven't seen your hour yet. My so. hour is very very different than what I do. Okay. I almost never do my hour in other shows because yeah. I uh, I'm really into storytelling. Mm -hmm. Like uh, uh, both of my solos are storytelling format. Child of Wuhan is like 90, 80 percent storytelling. Okay, and uh, Asian Daddy is like half half. Okay, so. I, so that's why it's, I, I normally don't do it outside of my, my, my solo because lots of things, uh, it's a flow and you need context to understand yeah. where it comes from. Yeah. And um, I just think your, your experience is really valuable because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that feel that way and like, I, I don't want to make generalizations, mm -hmm. but um, I have a sister-in-law from Hong Kong and have been to China and I know that there's very much like a culture of needing to be partnered up and how it's so expensive to get married yeah, and yeah, how yeah, yeah. people will like rent a boyfriend or a girlfriend because yeah. they're too embarrassed to go home and yeah. be single yeah which is weird because as a as a Westerner we don't think like oh everyone in China wants to be married but it's like there's kind of this pressure to find someone who's rich and smart and handsome and this and that and if you don't have that then you're a failure so you have to pretend that you have and so um, I, I guess I don't feel like that pressure is the same in the U.S. I think that it was, but I think now being single is just more... Um, and even my mom, she has to lie to people and marry them. Yeah, see, because, that's like so... Because no matter how oh successful you are, if you don't have a man, you are failure. Yeah, it's such a and strange, like, I think especially because we know that, like, there was kind of the one child policy so it's kind of like mm -hmm. the idea of marrying and having children seems like oh well that's not really a big deal in china because they it's like nope it's still very but now it's changing now it's changing especially a uh, woman like uh, mm. lots of uh, lots of family uh like uh, they they even support their their uh, girls to not get married because mm. in the past like when you have so many children mm -hmm. and uh, you just want to get out of get rid of the girls because they're just burdens mm -hmm. but now when everyone only have one child um slowly they learned why i want my 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 girl to marry some man and uh, in china there's so much like a this could like a, um, um, equality between men and women. Mm -hmm. Once you married, you have to take care of his family. Uh, very often bullied by by his parents, mm -hmm. and uh, take care of the children and all kinds of things. Uh, doing homework, housework, and uh, uh, now the the parents because right now the generation where the their children are like 20, 25, mm -hmm. the parents are relatively young also, mm -hmm. so they start to think, okay, like. This is my baby. This is the only baby I have. They call it like strawberry. It, There's like strawberry children or yeah. peach children where yeah. they're like too sensitive and yeah. tender. Uh, like they had thin skin yeah. because they're the one kid. And so the yeah, family yeah, yeah. kind of, the parents and mm. the grandparents all kind of focus in on yeah. this one child. Yeah, and then they, they realize, okay, in the past, if you have boy, I prefer boy. But now 
people have forced to learn to love their girls, and、mm-hmm. and once they learn that, they realize why I want my girl to marry someone and、uh, do housework for them, take、yeah. care of the children, and the,、uh, like being being bullied by the so、uh, they're questioning the, the, they, the structure because they see how disadvantaged they're. They realize I can just.、Yeah. I can just pay for my girl for the rest of her life. She doesn't need to get married. Yeah, it's actually But, easier on all of us. That, yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah, yeah. That they're taking on the burden of her husband as well, which is like, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. They, they are、That's、like so interesting. They are like, why I need her to marry? She can just live with us.、Uh, we we have enough money. Do you feel like you can talk about these things and sort of publish them? Within the Chinese community, or is that seen as controversial? Because when I hear your story, I'm like, that would be so healing and so powerful for Chinese people to hear that and to hear like Jim Jeffries bit about gun control is so good because he he hits all of these points, and so I think people that don't understand the debate or are very hard line about it, they watch that bit and it changes the way they think. And so I'm wondering if you have really good material about the pressure of. Marrying and then why that's stupid and because of that and if you can have clever comparisons of that's like this or that the people that have never questioned it will hear you and go oh my gosh but is that a threat to the system because I know in other countries where free speech isn't widely available they'll get you, I mean you can't even have a coffee mug with Winnie the Pooh on it because Xi Jinping is like nope that I mean he'll like shut why、down. are you talking that word now I have to cut that word out I can't say Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the like you, Winnie you, the feces. No, shouldn't say his name. Like,、oh. uh, fuck! Now I have to cut this. Um. Anyway, There, there's the there yeah, yeah, yeah. See the audio. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I I think I haven't talked about this part yet because this is way lighter trauma than than、yeah. the things I I I'm talking about now. Because、uh, I think if you get、um, like Zarnagar, because with Zarnagar has a market of、uh, Indian Americans. Can you let me finish? Oh, sorry. So yeah,、uh, if you found the market of Asian women、yeah. that have experienced it. Yeah, because like、grow. this trauma, this is so light, and this is so generic, and、uh, generic, and what I'm focusing on is really myself. Mm. And、uh, they are in love of debate, and even online now, lots of parents they were like. Just don't get married. Like、uh, it's fine. Like、uh, like why? Like、uh, if you don't get married, you lose so much things. Like、uh, you lose the burden of doing housework. <laughs> you lose、mm-hmm. the burden of uh, like uh, taking care of his family. You lose、mm-hmm. the burden of uh, like uh, someone complaining you use your own money.、Mm-hmm. You lose the burden of、uh, risking your life to making children.、Mm-hmm. Like this is enough of debate, and.、Uh, I I feel like what what you said is kind of funny because I feel like that's people always say people non comedians always say, oh this is interesting you should make a show about it but、uh, lots of things are interesting I would count yeah. them yeah. yeah yeah so much of comedy is editing and、yeah. deciding what to what to include what not to what、yeah. you want to say and what has been said and if you can say it yeah and, and uh, it uh, uh, regarding like Chinese audience you want more I have more. Uh, no, yeah,、I'm... we we need. To, I also need to leave. I think.、Uh, oh fuck, we need to leave. Okay, uh, great. Uh, that's uh, that's the podcast. Uh, yeah, we we actually start not that late, but we talk a lot of about comedy, not so much、uh, mental health. Uh, but、um, we are doing all right. Okay, mm-hmm. and uh,、yeah. uh, and if if you have one thing to say to fellow OCD friends, what you are going to say? Don't believe everything you think.、Mm-hmm. This is. They say that in twelve step twelve、uh, step meeting,、uh, don't wander around in your thoughts. It's like a bad neighborhood at night. You know, like don't don't get too stuck up here. Come out here, get some air, take a walk. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you very much.、That. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers, cheers. Bye, bye. Yeah. <laughs>